stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. This is Monday, August 5th. Any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, microphone, podium right over here. Come up and give us your name and address. Um, under public comment, we'll, we limit things to three minutes, if you would, please. And if we do have any vote up here tonight, before we vote, I will always try to remember to give you a chance to express your thoughts. Call the roll, please. Mayor Cedar? Here. Council Member Gottler? Here. Council Member Koopa? Here. Council Member Laporte? Here. Council Member Paul? Present. Council Member Bowles? Here. Council Member Watt? Here. All present. Thank you. Number four is the consent agenda. A is the City Council Minutes of July 15, 2024, special and regular meetings, recommendation approved. And B is the Golf Commission Minutes of June 11, 2024, recommendation received. Motion to approve A and B is presented. Support. Support. Are there any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Move on to number five. Ordinance of resolution. A, ordinance adoption 2405 golf carts. Uh, Your Honor, uh, this matter is uh, back for a second reading before council. Uh, you recall at our last meeting, there was a, a change requested to the, uh, the language. That correction has been made, and uh, the, the ordinance with that uh, adjustment is ready for uh, consideration for adoption. I will note that. Um, Subsequent to the change that was made, and obviously before tonight, there was an additional discussion I've had with Chief Raker and with uh, Mr. Bishop that um, there, there's not a provision in our ordinance is written, the proposed ordinance is written, for an inspection of the golf cart. Uh, there is a form that's required uh, for roadworthiness, and essentially our ordinance presumes that that's been taken care of. But uh, I think that uh, Chief Raker had made the observation that in the city of Marysville, um, they don't have a provision. They really just take the, um, the word of the applicant that their, their, uh, their golf cart is roadworthy. So we, we lack that in the current version. And I guess if it's, if it's the uh, council's wish, we could, it's, it's, it's your prerogative obviously to table further discussion and we could add an inspection provision, uh, or uh, again, it's it's certainly implicit in our ordinance. It has to be uh, roadworthy in order to, to be on the on the road. Uh, I don't know that it requires that that provision, but I just leave it to council's discretion. So, as worded, it works like a, a standard motorized vehicle. Like there are basic rules; everybody understands what they are. You don't follow them. Please pull you over. Fix your tail light. Fix your blinker. Yes. Fix your yes. Okay. Are the in the requirements are going to be posted and listed? Yes, there's a. Uh, in fact, what I think would make a um, if there were an inspection provision uh, rather simple. There's a form, a traffic form that the state of Michigan uh, prepares with a checklist. And uh, if, if there were such a provision in our ordinance, hypothetically, the uh, the officer who was performing the inspection would simply note. Uh, the various uh, uh, aspects, and, and, and the, the, the vehicle wouldn't pass inspection if any of these criteria were absent. Um, but uh, at, at this time, there, there's if for someone to come in and, and represent that, yes, my, my, uh, my golf cart is roadworthy, um, I guess that's an article of faith at this point. But would the officer do this inspection if pulled over for a different infraction, or is that something that's done completely separately in this situation prior to being on the road essentially well th 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 that's a good question the uh there, there's no requirement of inspection at this point the, the at any point in the process that's right the the applicant who's coming to get registered by the city of st Clair is uh by implication ver vouching that their vehicle is, is roadworthy but we're not imposing that requirement that you gotcha. have to show us mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if a, a, a vehicle were pulled over for some reason because it was obvious that it, it, it was not, uh, it, there's nothing that would prohibit the uh, officer from making the stop from pulling out that checklist and, and conducting an inspection gotcha. on the roadside. Okay, that's, yeah, that's essentially my question. Thank you. But we are going to require all these off-road vehicles to register 
And then we'll identify them with a sticker somehow that they have registered? Yes, right? that's correct. And then if they're, they're not registered, please pulls them over, they notice that, we'll give them X amount of days to go get it registered. Because how are we going to expect the police to keep track of all that? That's is, and does that separate road legal vehicles versus slow moving vehicles? Because some of them are registered to be in the road anyway. They're not going to come in and register. Right. This is this is all like an ORV. Yeah. I mean, if it's street legal and registered and has a plate and meets all of this, the state's mm -hmm. requirements, they're right. not coming right. to get a have to do that. approval. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I guess that's plated versus unplated. That's what well, I would Okay. Say. All right. Thank you. So plated versus unplated. Could you repeat your question, Mr. Watt? Sorry. People that have these off road vehicles. They're going to come in and register. I, I'm assuming they're going to. We're not charging them a fee. That's right. But we need to identify them with a sticker or whatever that they can put on their vehicle, so that you know if it says 24 for 2024, that the police can see that okay, they've registered with the city. Or if there's nothing on there, there's time that we give them to come in. That's that's the question, and right. that's discretionary with the officer. It's a violation to be on the road without the registration. So there could be a citation written. It would result in a fine. Or the officer might say, look, we've got this new ordinance that's been enacted. Uh, I'm going to make a note here. You've got to come in and have this, this vehicle registered within so many days, or I, I will pursue it as a, a violation. But that'll be the officer's yeah. discretion. And upon registration, um, will they receive some type of map or some type of indication about what roads golf carts are allowed on and not allowed on? Our uh, ordinance does call for a map to be uh, created that, that spells that out. And I think it would probably be uh, a good process to provide a copy of that map upon the registration. So we know that the person who's uh, secured this, this uh, designation knows on which roads they can operate their vehicle within the law. Great, thank you. So I pulled a copy of the Michigan, the state of Michigan's vehicle code excerpt um, that deals with golf carts. And I have a couple questions. Yeah, maybe, Chief, I might have to have him come up here because you may have to weigh in on this. As usual with trying to read state law, they just get very cumbersome at times, but um, I'll try to keep this quick and simple as I can. Um, when we talk about in our ordinance, uh, 58301B, a person shall not operate an RV at a speed greater than 25 miles per hour or posted lower speeds or in a manner that interferes with traffic on the street at a speed greater than 25 miles per hour. State law, unless I'm looking at this wrong, and I don't think I am, but number 14, a golf cart shall not be operated on a sidewalk and a golf cart shall not be operated at a speed not to exceed 15 miles per hour and no more than 30 per miles per hour on a state trunk line. So we can't, we, we have to go by state law, right? There's actually really two state laws that you get, I think you're reading 257657? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's golf carts that, uh, and then there's low speed vehicles and I could go on, there's slow speed vehicles, they're, that's why it's so confusing. But golf carts, you can allow golf carts to ride on the street with just hand signals if that's what you want, but that's not the safest thing in the world. I say we do the TR-54, they have their headlights, their taillights, their turn signals, and make that part of the ordinance. And part of this law number 21, you probably, I'm sure you know it, but there's like one, two, three, four, five, that, that talks about headlights, stoplights, tail right. lamps. Yep. Yeah. So, if it's, even if it's not in our ordinance, they have to obey what the state says as far as the golf cart things go. Correct. They, they do, but there's no uh, confirmation of that by the city in issuing the, uh, the registration. Yeah, the way it's written now, there's no, we're just taking our word for it that they got everything. But as far as speed limit, we're saying no greater than 25, but the state's saying not to exceed 15 miles on streets, 15 miles per hour on the street, and no, no, no more than 30 on a state trunk line. Yeah, I think that the uh, 30 came from the low speed vehicle. All right. 257660. All right, so, okay, thank you. And basically um, the map, I mean, for our town, 
the only road they really can't drive on is M29. Do you are you for the inspection pre-inspection? I'm for or it. just going by their word. I'm for it. I just don't want to do house calls. They have to bring it down to the city. You would yeah. like a pre-inspection, right? I, I wish. I, I think that it would be done at the time that the, the person or persons uh, make application for the right. registration. Yeah, it's just the stickers are going to make it a lot easier on the team. They can see the white sticker with, and they know they got it together or they don't. And uh, to me, because there's so many of them, and and people, I have this job, so people don't follow the rules. So there will be an education process, but I think after several months of education, we're hooking them. And because usually money makes people follow the rules. So we'll give them some time to learn, and then we'll start hooking them. So, Chief, um, I see golf carts on the street, and what makes me nervous is when I see the little, like the, uh, what I call a little kid driving them. Maybe they're 14, 15. That's, to me, still a little kid now. But under ours, under G, we say that unless a person possesses a driver's license, a person shall not operate in an ORV on a street if the ORV is registered as a motor vehicle under Michigan Vehicle Code and the ORV either is so many inches, so many inches. <clears throat> a person under the age of 18 shall not operate an ORV on the street unless that person is in possession of a valid driver's license or is under the direct supervision of a parent or guardian and the person has an in his or her possession, or an ORV safety certificate. But I go back to the state law, number five, it says a person shall not operate a golf court on any street unless he or she is at least 16 and has a license to operate the motor vehicle. Yeah, I, th I think there's a provision in there to allow us to be different, I believe, but I don't, I didn't go to law. Well, the first one you read, it sounded like between 16 and 18, if you don't have a license, but you have an ORV safety you can still drive not every 16 year old or 17 year old these days has a driver's license mm -hmm. so if they had the orv training then they could drive it but they have to be a minimum of 16 if they're between 16 and 18 and they have that and not a driver's license they can still operate the vehicle that's what it, i heard you read um and under 18 mm -hmm. can do what they have a in the if they're in the direct supervision of a parent or they have and the person has the ORV safety certificate. That's ours. But the state says you've got to be 16 and have a driver's license. So if the state police pull over my people on a golf cart and the kid's 15 with no driver's license, that's not legal. Right. I just want to make sure that when we get this thing penned in that we're as close to, I can always say the word perfect because it's not going to be perfect, but to I'll, me the age thing is, is kind of important. I'll, I'll review that. Well, let's, and we can get it. The tension on that. We're, couple months away from these things going in a garage for six months so yeah we get it right I, I agree with that chief I still don't I mean they're still golf carts they're made for golf courses and RV parks <laughs> so what is your we, preference we can make it as safe as possible but we you know if if a car runs a yield sign or a golf cart and the 2,000 par car hits a nine hundred pound golf cart it's not going to be pretty but yeah. what is your preference on age in licensing i think if if a parent wants to make that decision and let their 13 year old or 14 year old drive while they're sitting in the seat i don't have a problem with that but the problem is sometimes when you give that permission that 13 year old can drive when mom or dad is in the kitchen and they're going around the neighborhood that, and that's what i see yeah is an electric bike considered an orv no no and they come in stages. There's, I think, a level one, two, and three in in e-bikes. Level threes can't be on state paths. They all have to have pedals to be on state paths. And our path. So, oh, Chief, sorry to keep banging away on this thing, but I'm glad I read. Worst it case that. scenario: thirteen-year-old kids driving a golf cart with his dad somebody there's an accident and it's the golf cart's fault that kid by state law shouldn't be driving that vehicle should he no but by ordinance he can so i mean he's on a city he's on a local road i, I think that i think that the it's, it's clear that uh someone that's uh, under the age of 16 is not able to operate i think the issue is as you have identified is that gap between 16 and 18 if, if a person doesn't have a license but they're over the age of 16, may they operate in the presence of an adult if they have an ORV certification. And I'll, I'll try to resolve that tension 
if this is tabled before we come back. Okay, I think that's all the questions I had. Anybody else? <clears throat> hey, Mike, one second. We got to get a motion. We need a motion to table. Mm -hmm. I'll make that Support. motion. Support. All right, the motion is made uh, supported at the table. Are there any questions? I have any concerns. Come on up here, please, Frank. Frank Kleiss, 1104 Clinton Avenue. Um, I know that if I'm driving my car down the street and I get pulled over, and let's say I don't have a safety belt on, I get a ticket for that. I think a lot of those golf carts don't have safety belts. In them. <laughs> the RV ones might, but I don't think the golf cart. And the people I see driving down Clinton on those golf carts or on the bike path on those golf carts aren't buckled in at all. They're just hanging all over it, kids hanging out the back. It's, you know, uh, it's a safety issue, period. And I don't know who's responsible if we're allowing them to drive on our city streets. Thank you, so, Frank. That's it. Any other comments? All right, call roll, please. Ballard? Yes. Kufa? Yes. Report? Yes. Paul? Yes. Wolf? Yes. Watt? Yes. Cedar? Yes. Table, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, B, Resolution 2411, Jordan Creek Assessment, Mr. Bishop. I thought maybe somebody from the Drain Commission was going to. Okay, tag team. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so we've had numerous complaints on Jordan Creek. Um, we had a maintenance plan uh, done up by BMJ. They were gonna do it in four phases, thinking that we could get the bill paid, the assessment paid uh, over a four year period and do the work over a four year period. Um, our lowest bid was roughly 275,000. Uh, the next closest bid was 900,000 ballpark. So that's to do all four phases. Now, the problem is that it forks uh, just north of Brown, and we've had complaints on both branches, flooding issues. Um, so the resolution is to exceed the annual maintenance limit. We can spend 5,000 per mile in any given year. So if we were to do this project with the low bid, it would take us 10 years to pick up where we left off and complete both branches. Um, with the flooding on both ends, it'd be nice to just go in, do it all at once. Um, the impact this is a fairly good sized district. The impact isn't horrible to the residents and we can assess it over a period of time. So get in, save a little bit of money by doing it all at once. We'll leave a little bit of budget in there to spray because I know that vegetation will grow back and we'll have to be prepared for that. So, um, and then we'll, we'll just stretch the assessment out over a period of time that it's not gonna you know, affect anybody's tax bill horribly. So. Um, we're seeking resolution just so that we can do it all at once. What does funding work? It's a drain set. Well, okay. I'll, so I'll funding is, is similar to any other drain project. When you know, let's say this was a, a thirty thousand dollar project, we would we wouldn't even ask for a resolution, and we would just send everybody a bill on their winter taxes. That's that's how it goes. So um, the M dots on the hook, railroads on the hook, counties on the hook, city of St. Clair and Sinclair Township are all on the hook, and then the landowners pay a chunk of that too. So, so the total drain assessment, a district is created based on the drains that you're going to be working on. Right. And those we, as, those assess properties based on the total cost of the project. Correct. Those property owners are assessed, and then over a given period of time, that they're sent a bill, and that's what they that's what they owe to pay for that work done on the drain, which is in their which in their district. Now, when it comes to the two two twenty seven was the low. 257? 273, 76 was, was, I'm sorry, I take that back. Let me get to the right one. 257, 23 was the, the total. Um, that would be for DP Schweighoff or excavating. Next closest, and the only other bid that we had was body construction, and they came in at 899. Sure, and why it's so far apart. You know, body's been coming in really high on, on projects. I mean, they were really out of the ballpark on the next one. Um, and then everybody else is just, everybody's busy. Nobody wants to pick up a job this size, so. Yeah. And so, and how, how far can you spread that? We can go up to 10 years for the assessment. So if we did, you know, one year at a time, yeah. we would do the work, assess it out, do the work and assess it out. We could, we could potentially um, do this all at once and spread it over 10 years, which would be roughly the same. Right. You're adding interest though. Oh, okay. I understand that. So is there any kind of idea that, cause with the flooding that's going on, 
Is there any idea about the vegetation, the growth, the trash, the, th the debris that was in the drain? Do you have any idea of how much volume that keeps out of the drain? Um, and how much I don't have the bottom widths. I know through the golf course, it slumped in quite a bit. Um, it's, it's, it's loose soil through there. It doesn't really need the whole width that it is right now. Um, I think we're looking at doing a low flow channel through there just to kind of, if you keep it a, a narrower channel during not these, not these big rains we've had, but normal, <laughs> normal rains, it, it keeps the sediment moving. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into a wide area, it slows down, sediment drops out, fills it back in. So I know we've had issues with, um, you know, just landowner encroachment on, on this, dumping yard waste in there. That, that definitely doesn't help matter. So. Yeah. So, you know, so every, you know, pound of debris is amount of, yeah, there's I, volume of water that's not going through the ditch. It's being yeah, held I, back. I don't have a, a total volume amount. Um, yeah. We could get that. I just don't. It, you're paying for engineering at that point. I'd rather put shovel to ground. So. I know your drain districts, you know, they cross multiple jurisdictions. Um, I'm looking at a drain map. Thank you. Did you drop that off today? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great map. Thank Perfect. you. Um, what I noticed, too, is the Bowman drain. So the Bowman drain also comes in and affects the city on the, the western edge of the city. Yep. What's, I know we're talking about Jordan Creek here, but long-term... Bowman, Jordan Creek. What, what are we thinking about Bowman as well? So we've got Bowman cleared from the Magna plant that starts there on Range Road, mm -hmm. and we're cleared down to Vine. Uh, we had to do some debris cleanup with that. It was a five-inch rain in a 90-minute period. It flushed a lot of stuff out of the woods and into the You're drain, doing. so we had to do some more work in there. But um, I think we can probably yeah, get... Vine to the back of the high school. Yeah, Vine to the back of the high school is probably the next, next phase. Um, I think it starts picking up speed at that point, and it probably we'll see what we need to do with that yeah it, me it meanders north of brown but when it picks up some steam south of brown it really it does really move yeah yeah did we cover when this was last done this maintenance we did maintenance the from the pine year. river up to brown we ended it last year yep. um we had an exposure in the drain behind the shopping center there that we needed to address we had a large down willow we didn't want that floating down and damaging yeah, but the it. section north of brown when was it last done <laughs> Any? I don't really know. We had probably 50 years of neglect on drains in the county. It's been 20 plus. Probably, yeah. Right. And, uh, how long would you expect this work to be productive? Well, if we if we keep in a spray program on top of this, which is part of the plan, you know, the the bid to, for the construction is is that 275 will probably be about 300 thousand by the time we're we'll keep money aside to to do the spraying. Um, we used to mow it all the time and mowing. You mow it one year, you got to come back the next year and mow it again. But the spray, if you get it on the right rotation, it's about every six years. And then after that, it starts stretching out time. You don't even have to come back every six. So yeah. uh, the reeds really slow down a lot of the water. So and when they yeah. when the water slows and it's muddy, it drops out its sediment. So, so yeah. a ten-year assessment will buy us at least twenty years of productive, <laughs> based on experience. Can't promise you that, but yeah, yeah. yeah. With it, with the maintenance, is there any additional dredging? Is there any yeah. way to widen this out, smooth out the banks? Uh, we're then... not going to widen it. We, we have to take it back with, with maintenance. We have to go back to original design. So it'll get reconstructed back to original design. There is a section um, by the golf course that I think it widened itself out. So we'll go back to original design in the middle. Like I said, if we can keep that, that's an upper end area. Um, mm -hmm. What I mean by upper end, it's, it's the, where the drain starts in the golf course there. Um, if we can keep that water moving at a faster rate, it'll, it won't drop everything out. It'll, Keep moving it down. So, in your opinion, this maintenance program goes through. Will it reduce the chances that the creek crests? Yeah. Okay. Yep. One hundred percent. I know that Pug and Violet. That was the drain used to come through in an angle. It got shoved out the Pug and, and turned when the subdivisions were built. And that's just things we have to deal with. You know, it's not going back to the way it was. I. I don't even know if they would even let us put it back to Mother Nature's intended way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. very helpful. And to cover the cost of the project, you mentioned there was about five different entities that would split this in some fashion. Um, so, the city of Saint Clair, who, you know, we're here right now. Yep. That assessment then is that just uh, the responsibility of the residents and the tax base? It's not specific to property on the river. It's uh, a it's a watershed, so it's it's apportioned out over the over the watershed. Anybody that contributes water to the drain gets a chunk of it. So, um, city of Saint Clair is four point zero seven one percent of the total bill. 
How many? Four point zero seven one. Oh. Okay. So our last assessment last year was a, a two-year assessment. Uh, we we did thirty-three thousand dollars worth of work, and the city of St. Clair's amount was a thousand three sixty. So you probably, you know, do math on that and tenfold it. Okay. Thank you. We will look at it from a assessment standpoint to see how it affects the lands. We always try and look at how it's going to affect the homeowner. You know, municipalities can handle a chunk of change without, and I hate to say that to you, but it's the landowners that we really concentrate mm -hmm. on. So, mm -hmm. any other questions? All right, thank you. I'll ask for a motion to. For support of the resolution, if it's in, so ordered. I'll make the motion. Order. Order. The motion made supported. Questions? Call the roll, please. Fowler? Yes. Kufa? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Paul? Yes. Bowles? Yes. Watt? Yes. Cedar? Yes. Resolution adopted. All right, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, let's go to number six, reports administration, Mr. Bishop. I have a couple things I'd like to go over tonight. First, I'd like to welcome Ms. Brenda Hill uh, to the team at, uh, at St. Clair in the office. She's our new office clerk. Uh, she came with us after having a great interview and, and meeting everybody, and uh, she started uh, her time with us. Uh, it's on a part-time basis, 30 hours a week. Uh, she'll be picking up uh, right where Ms. Ray Lynn had dropped off, and, and so far so good. So I just wanted to make a public announcement that we do have a Ms. Brenda Hill who's going to be working in the office. And if you have the time to come by, say hello, introduce yourself. I know she'd be, you know, happy to meet everyone. Um, wanted to, uh, uh, two things about the the boat race. I want to make a comment on. First, of the police, I want to say thank you for being present. I want to say thank you for coordinating all the different jurisdictions that were out there in the, in the mutual aid. I know that they look to you though for the direction. So. Thank you for that. We really appreciate your time and service in that way. Also, the DPW, um, we said it after the fireworks, and I'll say it again after the boat races, the ability for a team of the size that we have, and it's not extraordinarily large, but to get into the park, uh, start early in the morning, clean up through, um, and people enjoying the Palmer Park in the afternoon um, is something to be said about their efforts. So I truly appreciate that. I want to publicly thank them for that. I want to mention about the flooding. I um, uh, No less than... You know, I, I was putting together 30 plus calls to homeowners today, and, and I know people in this town were affected, and I feel really bad about that. And and we were looking into, you know, can, do we have the capacity? Are our drains working? Does the infrastructure keep up? And a resounding no, the infrastructure does not keep up with the amount of water. You know, five inches in one hour, um, the pumps can't run hard enough to get the part uh, the water cleared. You know from those pipes and so it was remarkable amount of water and i don't say that flippantly um, because it affected people's homes and i do feel bad about that there's water in the basement there was property loss um, people lost belongings um, we can control a lot of things but we cannot control five inches of rain in an hour and then as the ground soaked and saturated and we haven't displaced all that water remember in st Clair county throughout we there's a lot of clay here water table sets up pretty high and if the water and the ground and the earth is saturated like a sponge and there's nowhere else for that water to move away, it's going to come up. And then where does it go? Right? It will find the point of least resistance and unfortunately, they find in people's homes. Um, we are calling every single homeowner that had called. Nobody's missing a phone call. It might take us a couple of days to get through everybody because I was inundated. I know the people in the front office were inundated with calls. But everybody's getting a phone call back and as long as that conversation takes we'll spend time with them to, so they can understand what's going on called aew and what i'd like to find out is one all capacity where's the water flowing to where are the pinch points where do things bottleneck and then get ahead of these things and address it look from the north end to the south end on our system where do we take in water um, from the township where is that the heaviest our systems handling it there I also just want to figure out just, you know, what's the moisture content of the ground? How much water, you know, how much water do we actually have still sitting in the ground for it nowhere else to go? I think it's important that we address this. I think it's important to say like, oh, you know, it's a hundred year rain event. Well, it happened twice <laughs> in two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so be prepared for when you know something's going to happen. And so we're taking a look at this. 
um, and there's going to be some thought and some effort into it. So I just want to give that announcement. That we are, we see it, we hear it, we are listening, and we know people are affected. And I'm, and I'm sorry for the people that were affected. And we're going to try to find some type of resolution. Okay. Um, with that, I want to give a quick update about the Golf Street project. And so, um, what's happened out on Golf Street, and some of the the craftsmanship and the workmanship um, that I've seen and addressed um, is not meeting expectation. You know, it's no is what it is it's either black or white and in this case it didn't it's not hitting the mark okay um it's everything from dry cutting cement when you should wet saw cement you should wet you should wet cut anytime you put a blade to asphalt or concrete it's construction 101 it's common sense the silica in that cement is a nasty product once it gets airborne and it's a residential neighborhood i see stuff like that i don't like it i don't like it so we address it um Things like the slopes of driveways, the slopes of approaches, uh, installing the sidewalks. I talked with a gentleman today and you know, he never got water before and he has water now because he has a sidewalk that dips in front of his house. And so I wanna address that. Um, I see these things, we're addressing these things. I've been on the phone with AEW and they're all punch list items. And so what that means is a punch list item for anybody who doesn't know, punch list means this. Before you get paid on your final paycheck, there's a punch list. And you got to meet every recommendation. Or not, it's not a recommendation. It's a punch list. You have to meet. You have to clear every error within that project before the final payment's cut. And I, I wholeheartedly expect that that punch list will be complete. And so everything from how the galvanized lines were taken out and put back in and improperly on service lines, which caused property damage, um, to any insurance claim that the contractor needs to deal with, all those things need to be buttoned up, tied up before we sign off on that completely. Okay. I just recognize that uh, this particular project did not meet expectations. I'm making note of that, and we're making note of the whole thing, and I want to just make a public announcement that we see it, and we're not letting it slide. Okay? With that being said, um, I wanted to, and I see here, and we'll get down to new business here in a second, where we talk about uh, the budget, but if I could, and if it's an appropriate time to do it, um, could I yield a little bit of my report? And what I'd like to do is I would like to have um the city intern this is uh jimmy downey and he comes from us for u of m and he had the opportunity to intern with us and in our first meeting i said this is well, i'm going to let him explain everything he did but i i just want to know like internship should mean something you should actually see some things it's not about what you know just go out there wash cars and pick up trash this is about actually putting real work real world experience in the hands of a young person who's ready to take the world on you know we were all there at one time we thought we could all do it so um, he's at that stage right now, very proud of his efforts, and he'll be leaving us August 13th, and so this will be the last opportunity. And we'd just like to hear about your experience and what you took away from it. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Jimmy Downey, 19 North Thursday Avenue. Uh, I'm a revising sophomore at the University of Michigan, and I have had the opportunity to intern at City Hall this summer. Over the last eight weeks, I have been involved in a wide variety of projects, all of which have enhanced my understanding of municipal government. To get into the specifics, uh, my main task this summer was to digitize all the accounts payable from this fiscal year, beginning October of 2023. Yeah. So my job was to unstaple these records of city expenditures, scan them, uh, and restaple them, and put them back in the filing cabinet so that these records were more easily accessible. Uh, and because of this, uh, so City Hall would not be able, the people that work there would not have to get on their hands and knees and rifle through a file cabinet to find uh, more information or context into the payments. Uh, all they would have to do is simply uh, click on a file on a computer and then access them, make it a lot more easier. And because of this, I joke with my friends that I was uh, pushing the city into the 21st century. <laughs> Thank at, you, Jim. <laughs> at first, I found this process of unstapling, scanning, and restapling to be monotonous. But after the few, first few days, I started to notice trends, like how there was a phone and le electricity bill every month, how travel is always reimbursed, and that there are uh, many of the same vendors that appear every week. With my stapler, stapler remover, scanner, and a plastic cut to put the staples in, I got to work and caught up in the present date by July 18th. From this experience, I learned that the city of St. Clair covers a wide variety of expenses, many of which I would have never thought of. As, as, as small as St. Clair seems compared to my college town of Ann Arbor, there are a lot, and I mean a lot, of expenses involved with running the city efficiently. And by being tasked with digitizing all these documents, I learned the true expanse of the city's uh, finances. And being returning here, I also got to sit in on quite a few uh, meetings with City Superintendent Quinn Bishop and others discussing fiscal and civic interests in the city. Some memorable meetings included the 4th of July Fireworks Financial Report with Quinn and Treasurer Jessica Gilroy. 
I was unaware of the magnitude that the businesses in St. Clair contributed financially to the fireworks show, and it was great to see how much the community helps to put on such a great event. Uh, just last week on July 31st, in a meeting with Quinn, Jessica, and representatives of St. Clair Township, discussing the sewer lines between the city and the township, I was happy to see great problem solving and productivity, as everyone was staring at the TV screen, looking at sewer lines, and trying to remedy uh, a lot of confusion. And lastly, on a more humorous side, uh, in a Zoom meeting uh, in late June with Quentin and Police Chief Raker discussing the construction on Yankee and Range, I learned the importance of proper meeting efficiency and also to remember to stay muted on the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I found every meeting I was in to be very informative and interesting, and I was grateful to be a sponge soaking up all the information. When I wasn't at my desk uh, scanning accounts payable or sitting in on meetings, I was helping the building department. This is one of my favorite parts of the internship because I had the opportunity to write a letter for code enforcer Tom Lutenkoff detailing the upcoming sign inspection on August 12th. To write this letter, I had to read up on all the rules for signage in the city, which took a couple hours. And as a result of this, I will never forget the golden rule of signage, that if a sign is not permitted, it is prohibited. <laughs> Around the office, I helped install a uh, designated printer for the building department and stored building files. But my favorite part of helping the building department was traveling to Pine Shores Golf Course on July 25th to inspect the gas meters. Getting out of the office and doing municipal work for the city was fun, and I learned from Tom that oftentimes you have to talk to people in the community in order to get the answers you want, uh, and that municipal government is very much a hands-on experience, with communication and transparency being very important in doing the job the right way. From this internship, I'll take away the importance of effectiveness in municipal government, from seeing the clerks answer questions on the phone and at the front desk, to talking with Tom and Mayor Cedar about the future of Wi-Fi in the mall, Seeing people engaged in the maintenance and productivity of the city made me more greatly appreciate the work that gets done in St. Clair. In conclusion, whether I was sitting in on a meeting, buzzing guests into the office, or helping Mr. Dingaman operate Microsoft Word, I've appreciated <laughs> all my tasks. I'm grateful for my time at, at St. Clair City Hall. I believe that my many weeks here will help me as I start a new semester in Ann Arbor. Thank you. Yeah, good job. <laughs> <laughs> he was a real ple he, he was a real pleasure to have with us. I have to say that I remember that when t t Jimmy and Tommy, Tom, Tommy, and I were sitting there talking about Wi-Fi in the mall. As you can see, Tom, uh, Jim is very articulate and, and very intelligent, and uh, like the opposite of his dad almost. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, you should be proud. Both of you guys should be proud of each other. I think you probably are. That was good. It was a good thing. Thank you. Anything else? No, that, that's a good. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good. That's a good way to All right. Yeah. Um, okay, Mr. Well, Mr. Johnny, you can, how are you gonna follow that? No, I can't, Your Honor. I have nothing to add tonight. <laughs> All right. Hey, the department, Nat, you got some over there? I do. Just an update on early voting. As you can see, um, the room is set up for the election tomorrow, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Polls will be open for the state primary. Um, early voting went well as far as the equipment, the workers. Um, the, the training was so beneficial. Everything went well. However, it is still very slow. We are required to have nine days, a minimum of eight hours each day, which that's what we did. We had a total of 87 voters throughout that time, which is approximately one an hour. Um, but on the bright side, it's good training. We anticipate it to be much um, uh, used more in November. We'll be pushing it more in November to alleviate any potential long lines on the November presidential day. So uh, we had our second go around. February was the first time. And then we just had it this time. All the glitches are out. We're ready to rock and roll for November. Um, so I'm just going to take that away that it's good practice for November. So again, polls open tomorrow, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Make your voice heard and vote, please. Thank you. Well, D, authorities, boards, commissions, county, commissioners, anything, anybody? No one finished business. We'll go to number eight, new business, a scheduled public hearing, fiscal year 25 annual budget. Mr. <clears throat> yeah. uh, the annual budget hearing for the proposed budget of 2024 fiscal year needs to be scheduled. And per the charter, the budget must be approved by September 30th for the next fiscal year. The recommendation is to schedule the public hearing for Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024 at 7 p.m. September 3rd at 7 p.m.? Yes. I'm guessing that's the day after Labor Day? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you want to take this time now to schedule a work session before the next council meeting, if that's six, for the budget? Or? Um, you know, on, on that topic, in front of um, every councilman up here, you should see uh, really 
well, let's see here. Four, you should have four documents. You have the large draft budget, which talks about every fund, every department, every account. Office, ser uh, office services, fees, schedules, those types of things are in the second packet. You'll see a <coughs> condensed city draft budget, and these are, these are the major funds. These are the ones that really contribute to the <coughs> overall spends. And then you'll see the capital improvement plan uh, that stretches out for the next five years. If you would, take the time, go through your, everybody sits on a commission, go through your commission's budget, take a look at them, ask any questions, get a hold of me, and you know, let's really go through the fine tooth comb so all the commissions are on the same page. I can answer any questions, especially from residents within your ward. If they have a question about a particular line item or a particular department, shoot that over to me. I'll be happy to jump on a call, send an email out, get a hold of whoever needs to so we can really button this up. Um, but I would like if we could schedule at our next council meeting, 6 p.m., um, that'll be a, uh, just another workshop. And it's really just to finalize the draft, without finalizing, obviously we can't do that until uh, that September 3rd meeting, but what we're looking to do is uh, really answer any questions so we're going in and we've really covered, you know, uncovered any uh, questions there maybe before we finalize, okay? All right, so the next meeting, our next regular meeting, we'll do a six o'clock work shop on tag, or on yeah. budget. Do we need a motion on that or anything? Or are we just good with it? I think so. Can you please? No. Yeah, I'll, I'll make that motion. Meeting. Supported. Motion yeah. made support questions. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, six o'clock, next regular meeting. Hmm? All right. Yeah. Do we you need a motion bonus. for the scheduling of the public hearing as well? Did we do that? We didn't do that yet. So I'll make a motion to schedule the public hearing for fiscal year 25 annual budget. Or questions? That'll be September 3rd at 7 o'clock. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, B, Chief, special event, uh, St. Clair Rotary Turtle Race. Yeah, Mayor Council, St. Clair Rotary Club has turned in all their paperwork for their annual turtle drop race on September 8th in the Pine River, Rotary Park. And I say that you approve it. I'll make a motion to approve. Support. Questions? Part of that approval will be they're selling tickets to 6th, 7th. And then there's going to be a couple banners that uh, are part of that whole process. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Chief. Number nine's claims and accounts for July 18th, July 25th, and August 1st. I got a question on bottom of page one. G2 Consulting Group, what is that? Uh, G G2 Consulting Group, um, they're a testing company. They test asphalt. So what happens is, so a batch of asphalt comes in. What they'll do is they'll test the density, they'll test, uh, they'll test the temperature, they'll test the mix before it goes in. And then when it sets up, they're the company that tests that as well to make sure that the product that's, that we ordered is what's in the truck and then what, and it's laid properly. So they're, an they're, a, they're another inspection service specifically for what we lay on the ground. Anybody else? Can I take care of it? Okay. Hearing no other questions, Your Honor, I make a motion to approve as presented. Or, all right, the motion may support the questions. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We'll go to number 10, public comment, public questions. Anybody have any non-agenda items? Please keep it to three minutes if you could, please. Frank Clay, 1104 Clinton Avenue. I'm just curious about political signs, signage for people that are running for political office and uh, where they're placed. I see a lot of political signs on vacant properties and corners and stuff like that. And I thought they had to have permission to place signs on open areas of land from the owners of that land. I know that uh, People came to my house and asked if they could place the sign on my property. So I don't know where that stands in the city of St. Clair, but I see a lot of political signs that are just on vacant corners and you know open uh, construction sites like by the school over on Kearney or right over here on Kearney. Um, so I'm just curious as to what that rule is in the city of St. Clair. Do you have any rules here on that? 
Uh, well, as a overall rule, signs are not allowed in any easements, and yes, they do need permission um, from the property owner. So um, specifically, the development area that you spoke of is privately owned, so mm. perhaps it was permitted so from the owner. There was permission probably granted, then, is what you're saying. Possibly. I yeah. wouldn't know okay. that, so okay. unless there's a like a formal complaint to investigate. I'm just curious. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Make it break. The bells? All right. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Paula Campbell, 804 Clinton. I just want to say and, and thank uh, Bodie or Body, however you want to uh, call his name. Those guys have worked their butts off. I'll tell you, especially with all the water and everything, you know, on our street. But they have been out there and pouring rain and everything. And I. I got to give them a lot of credit and a lot of accolades they these guys are great and i just wanted that to be known by everybody they they have been really i'm kevin kevin's there all day long so nighttime he's out there so they've been great really gracious to everybody in the neighborhood and everything so thank you thank you Paul. anybody else all right, let's go down to number 11. Mayor and Council have a few things, and then I'll allow anybody else who needs time. Um, movie night is August 13th. Is that in Palmer Park, right? I believe so. All right, that's movie night. Everybody can invite. I don't know what they're showing this year. Does anybody know? No. I don't know. Um, I also want to mention the boat races. Uh, that committee, Butch Kinsfeder, Bob Courier, they did a great job. And the volunteers and the sponsors, just so many uh, uh, good things were happening that weekend. It was a good a weekend for the city, I think. Uh, Dave Shorkey and the Mardi Gras down at the Boat Harbor over the weekend. That was another uh, successful event. Thank you to Murphy's. Uh, the Hoedown, if you didn't get downtown in the courtyard this weekend, a lot of different people in town, different kind of music, and it was kind of nice to see that happening. Um, good luck in A-squared, Jimmy. Anybody else got something? Oh, happy birthday, Mr. Paul. Whoa. Hey. Today, hey. 39, I think. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I just want to mention a thank you for excusing my absence for the last month. For the second year in a row, I've been in New York City studying, working on a PhD in music education. I can't tell you how glad I am to be back in St. Clair after being in New York <laughs> for that time. Even with all our the subways, traffic. <laughs> the traffic, all that stuff is fine in New York for the t time and place that it is, but it's really great to be back in St. Clair. Thank you. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And belts. All right, I'm going to ask for number 12, a closed session, uh, uh, request a closed session to confer with legal counsel for the purpose of discussing a confidential attorney-client legal opinion on pending litigation. I'll ask for a motion to that effect. Uh, we'll ask you to clear the room. This is where we hold it. And you can wait up in the lobby. We'll come get you. Uh, we may or may not take action <clears throat> after the closed session. I don't know at this time if that will or not happen. I'll ask for a motion to go to closed session for that purpose. So moved. Support. Any questions? Call the roll, please. Ufa? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Paul? Yes. Bowles? Yes. Watt? Yes. Gottler? Yes. Cedar? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Be careful out there.